Hello. Just tweeting out the uh, live streaming link. All right, I'm going to be reading this book, starting with the translator's introduction. Probably not going to be giving any commentary for the time being, but uh, maybe eventually. I'm going to try to be reading for about an hour every day. So if you don't know, this book was written by Theodore Adorno in uh, some year. And the text itself is mostly like undifferentiated, just text with the occasional like a uh, paragraph break, but there are no like chapters. Really just goes on. It's written like intentionally to be difficult to read. Uh, and anyway, I'll start with the translator's introduction. Every translation must fit one world inside another, but not every work to be translated has been shaped by emphatic opposition to the world into which it must be fitted. This is, however, the case with aesthetic theory, which Theodore Adorno was able to write only by leaving the United States, where he had lived for a decade during the war years, became a citizen, and often thought he might need to remain. Any review of the many American phrases that Adorno scornfully quotes throughout aesthetic theory, the tired businessman, the pinup, the what do I get out of it, will confirm that not least of all, the book was written in refusal of a country that it depicts as a completely commercial order. Even so unpro unproblematically scannable a phrase as only what is useless can stand in for the stunted use value draws on the transformation of distinctly European experiences of aristocracy. In the United States, such an idea, it gets as far as cognition, falls askance of the inheritance of a puritanical mind that is always suspected that art does not properly work for a living and might encourage others to do the same. In just opening to any page without bothering to read a word, one sees that the book is visibly antagonistic. No one from the land of edutainment would compose these starkly unbeckoning sheer sides of type, uninterrupted by chapter titles or typographic markers, that has severed and jettisoned every approach and patched over most every apparent handhold. The book's stylistic peculiarities derive as a whole from what makes aesthetic theory inimical to an American context that it is oriented not to its readers, but to the thing in itself. This is not, as will be immediately suspected, motivated by indifference to its readers. On the contrary, the book makes itself remote from its consumption out of interest in and by its power of self-immersion. Aesthetic theory is an attempt to overcome the generally recognized failings of aesthetics, its externality to its object, that Barnett Newman once did the world the favor of putting in a nutshell when he famously quipped, speak of himself as a painter, that aesthetics is for me like what ornithology must be for the birds. Artworks are after all unique, not least in that when they are experienced, they are experienced from within. It is possible to vanish into a novel or a painting and be half surprised, looking away for a moment, that the world was ever there at all. Anyone turning to aesthetics would expect that to call itself aesthetics, it would be allied with what is exceptional in the experience of its object. But what is discovered instead is a discipline that throughout its history has worked at the conceptual undergirding of standards of beauty, the sublime, taste, art's dignity, and so on, while failing to achieve the standard of the experience of what it purports to treat. The suspicion is irrepressible that either aesthetics is the work of the willfully deaf, blind, and insensate, or that art is under a spell that prohibits its inner comprehension, as if here one is permitted entry as nowhere else, only on the condition that one leave empty-handed and never be able to say what the difference is between it and having just been distracted. Adorno's aesthetic theory means to breach the externality of aesthetics to art. 
it is hardly the first effort to do so. When it, but when aesthetics has become dissatisfied with itself and tried to es escape its externality, it has almost always taken the form of pretending to be art in a pictorial, effusive voice, but has offered to act as a maitre d to a specialized domain of pleasure. Either effort, however, only camouflages the presupposition that intellect must renounce knowing art from within. Aesthetic theory, by contrast, is oriented to an early aphorism that Adorno wrote about music that was seminal to his thinking about art as a whole. Quote, we don't understand music, it understands us. End quote. The aesthetics required by this perception would be remote to all art appreciation. Its sight lines would run opposite those angled by the intensifying need for art that makes people mill around art museums in constantly greater numbers. It would be art's own understanding, the presentation of its truth content. Conjuring this genie out of the bottle would seem to require the sacrifice of subjectivity to what is beyond itself. The thing in itself is to speak. Subjectivity's own voice must only interfere. This thesis could perhaps look for confirmation in dialectic of enlightenment, which Adorno and Horkheimer show that fascism did not simply coax cornered reason into delirium, but was itself a potential implicit in reason's own compulsion toward all-encompassing domination. Yet the authors never sought to subvert subjectivity or to countermand enlightenment, the course of subjectivity's development as reason. If enlightenment had come to a dead end in fascism, its abrogation would make terror permanent. Rather, Adorno and Horkheimer took the side of enlightenment and tried to discern the nature of social constraint because the domination of nature unwittingly requires the sacrifice of subjectivity. The recognition that in maxima potentia minima licentia is millennia old. The dialectic of enlightenment took this thought in a strictly modern direction. If the self is progressively limited and deprived through the domination of its object, if humanity is subordinated to necessity by the struggle against it, then the emancipation of the subject depends on its capacity to emancipate its objects, and this requires all possible subjective spontaneity. Adorno's thesis that subjectivity could only be transcended by way of subjectivity and not by its limitation is one way of formulating his seminal insight that identity is the power of non-identity. The philosophical meaning means for giving shape to what is more than subjectivity would be paradoxically those of conceptual cognition that since Kant's Copernican turn specifically limited knowledge to the world constituted by subjectivity this side of the thing in itself. As Adorno wrote in the introduction to negative dialectics, he considered it the task of his thought to use the strength of the subject to break through the fraud of constitutive subjectivity. The power of identity manifests in Kant's transcendentalism as concepts that constitutively define the likeness of the world with the subject would go beyond constitutive subjectivity if concepts could be developed in such a way as to present what is more than conceptual in them. That concepts are more than their de definitional content is implicit in the idea of a dialectic of enlightenment. For if it, enlightenment regresses to the natural necessity that it attempts to dominate, and concepts, which ostensibly serve to identify the world with its knower, are actually artifacts most deeply shaped by what enlightenment never mastered. Identity must be more than identity in that it draws back into itself what it purports to overcome. The concealed content of enlightenment, the content of concepts, would be the nature that subjectivity sought to dominate in its own rise to power. This defines Adorno's approach in aesthetic theory to the possibility of breaching the externality of aesthetics to art, an aesthetics that wants to know art from within, to present what art itself understands, which consists of what a contemporary nominalist intelligence, always verging on irrationalism, 
dismisses as the oppressive, overstuffed furnishings of an age credulous of absolutes. Natural beauty, arch beauty, truth, semblance, and so on, the fundamental concepts of aesthetics. Although these concepts merged in the effort to master their material, they're more than that. <clears throat> freed from the compulsion of domination that would potentially reveal their participation in what they sought to dominate and impress of that through which they developed. Aesthetic concepts would become the memory of nature sedimented in art, which for Adorno takes shape in aesthetic theory as the unconscious, mimetically written history of human suffering against which enlight enlightenment elsewhere seals itself off. Only this content could possibly bring reason's struggle for domination to its senses and direct its power to what would actually fulfill it. Thus Adorno organized aesthetic theory as a paratactical presentation of aesthetic concepts that by eschewing subordinating structures breaks them away from their systematic philosophical intention so that the self-relinquishment that is implicit in identity could be critically explicated as what is non-intentional in them, the primacy of the object. Throughout his years in the United States, Adorno on many occasions met with the rejection of his work by publishers who saw his writing simply as disorganized. It was obvious to Adorno that what he was pursuing required his return to Germany if only because in the 1950s publishing was still less commercially unfulfilled, no, still less commercially unified than in the United States and permitted writers greater control over the work than here. One event did, however, finally prompt him to leave when the editorial board at the Psychoanalytic Society of San Francisco finished with his essay, Psychoanalysis Revised, he found that the entire text was disfigured beyond recognition. The basic intention could not be discerned. As Adorno recounted, the head editor explained that the standards to which the essay had been adjusted, which made it look like every other essay in the journal, were those of the profession. I would only be standing in my own way, Adorno was told, if I passed up its advantages. I passed them up nevertheless. Adorno moved back to Europe. Adorno's sense that staying here would have impossibly burdened his work was confirmed long after the fact by the first English translation of Aesthetic Theory in 1984. The publisher, partially against the will of the translator, discarded the book's form as a superstitiously imposed impediment that would only stymie the book's consumption. Diametrically opposed to the course the book took in its various drafts in Adorno's own hands, a process that led to, in the final version, to the rejection of the division of the book into chapters. The 1984 translation arrived on bookstore shelves divided into numbered chapters with main headings and subheadings inserted in the text. Paragraph indentations were distributed arbitrarily throughout, completing the image of a monodirectional sequence of topic sentences that could be followed stepwise from chapter one through chapter 12. This subordinated the text's paratactical order to a semblance of progressive argumentation that offered to present to present the book's content conventionally, or conveniently, sorry. This device provided a steady external grip on the book while causing it to collapse internally. For in lieu of any argumentative structure in the text itself, because it contains no homogeneous substance that can be followed from start to finish, the flaring clarity of paragraph indentations only produced a contrast by which the simulated paragraphs appeared murky in the refusal to parse into stages of thesis and evidence. And whereas the paratactical text demands that every sentence undertake to be the topic sentence and that the book be composed of long, complex phrases, each of which seems under the obligation to present the book as a whole, the 1984 translation carved up sentences in the image of declarative vehicles of content. The original paratactical text is concentrically arranged around a mute middle point through which every word seeks to be refracted and that it must express. 
The text cannot refer forward or backward without distributing this nexus through which the parts become binding on each other. The linear argumentative structure imposed on the text by the translation thus dismissed the text's middle point as a detour and severed its nexus. Compulsory unification serves only to fragment. The imposed structures set whole passages adrift whose suddenly evident isolation required further apparatus to span them. Therefore, transitional phrases were interpolated such as, as we saw, or as we said, or let us remember. The narrative persona that was projected into the text at these points and elsewhere was credible insofar as it seemed to substantiate an argumentative model of knowledge and its transmission. But this further contributed to muffling a text that, by its own standards, succeeds only insofar as what is particular in it begins to speak for itself. The rejection of the work's form as a superstition was carried over to the treatment of the original's many Greek, Latin, and French concepts and phrases. They were rendered literally in English and without any marking, as if their content was clear enough once they had been freed from their alphabetical inconvenience. Thus, for instance, chorismos, the contrary of methesics, methexis, was translated as separatism, obfuscating the articulation of the problem of the participation of idea and objects from Plato to Benjamin, that is, so to speak, the topic of aesthetic theory and the whole of Adorno's writings. The many American phrases, which have such abrupt expressive power in the original, were likewise seamlessly absorbed into the scenery. Almost ingeniously, the language of the 1984 text pulls away from the movement of thought that can still be sensed gesturing underneath, giving the book a disembodied quality as if it were dubbed rather than translated. Subordinated to the principle of exchange by its coerced identity with the subject's form of consumption, aesthetic theory in translation became a model of what it protests against, the primacy of the constitutive subject. The irony is, of course, that by narrowing the distance of the book from its readers, ostensibly for their own good, but fundamentally to sell it to them, the work was put beyond them. Wow. Flex. This volume is an entirely new translation of aesthetic theory. The spatial organization of the text is identical to the original. The major sections of the English text are divided only where the original divides. The sentence structure and phrasing of the original were maintained wherever possible, given the tremendous differences of English syntax from the original. All words foreign to the original, including English words, occur here in italic. This translation, however, took its lead not so much from the aim to copy the appearance of the original, but rather from Adorno's description of the hearing implicit in Mahler's music, an amplitude of a hearing encompassing the far distance to which the most remote analogies, analogies and consequences are virtually present." End quote. In aesthetic theory, this amplitude occurs, however, not in the mimetic response of a musical passage to each other, but in the medium of concepts as the subterranean dynamic relations. The coherence of these subterranean relations depends on the text's paratactical form and survives only by a density of insight, not by external structures. This defines the text and its translations particular vulnerability the slightest slackening of intensity threatens to dissolve the text into a miscellany. Nothing supports the text except the intensity with which it draws on and pushes against itself. With few exceptions, paratactical works are therefore short, fragmentary, and compacted by the crisis of their own abbreviation. Paratactical texts are intensive, almost to the denial of their quality, of extension. And the more extensive the paratactical work actually is, an aesthetic theory is almost unparalleled in this, the greater the potential for its unraveling at each and every point. The text therefore requires a rhetoric that will heighten concentration and density and absorb sentences with long haul subordinate clauses that engage with that, that, ellipses, 
that grips cognition like the ratchet on a roller coaster with the demand for cooperative anti-gravitational struggle to the top of the first slope so momentum can be discovered shooting down the main claws into any number of concluding subordinate sweeps. Wow. <laughs> the paratactical text is inimical to exposition. Inimical to exposition, and Adorno uses the most condensed gestures to invoke rather than propound relevant philosophical arguments. A single sickness unto death does the work of all of Kierkegaard. Positive negation, all of Hegel, and any phrasing that even subliminally hints at in the age of is expected to conjure the entire argument of Benjamin's artwork in the age of mechanical reproduction, to which the book is, as a whole, a response. But at the same demand for density, Adorno refers wherever possible to artists and artworks in the familiar. Recherche is more than enough for Proust's title. The marriage could not be anything but that of Figaro, and George is plenty for Stefan George. Wherever parallel linguistic resources were available, these and Adorno's many other techniques of condensation and heightening have been used to maintain the density of this translation. In the case of some titles and authors, however, especially of German authors and works that have become progressively unknown in the aftermath of World War II, they are too improbably remote even to pretend they could be recognized and had to be provided with first names and full titles. And there is another technique of condensed reference used constantly by Adorno that could not be incorporated at all because it is uniquely a potential of the original vis-a-vis -vis English. As is well known, German is able to refer to by pronouns with specificity across any distance of text, long or short, and juggle many nouns with referential consistency. Adorno employs this linguistic resource to an extreme in order to avoid the repetition of nouns in a text that is allergic to even the few millimeters of slack such repetition would feed in. In some passages, the weave of pronouns because, becomes so remote and tenuous but it seems it could only be followed by someone who would comprehend the reference anamnestically as if known from eternity. Anamnestically. They demand a level of concentration that inhabits the text completely, since English has no comparable pronominal structure this internal weave of reference could not possibly be matched in translation. It has, therefore, throughout been necessary to choose between potential glibness and precision of reference. Without exception, the latter was preferred, however ungainly the result. This is the recognition of an aporia of translation, and as a result is not entirely a betrayal of Adorno's text. For however difficult his writing may be, it is never vague or simply a Evocative. This dude has vocabulary. This translation has not supposed that it is simply a failed replica of the perfections of the original. The original has plenty of problems of its own that it imposes on the translation. Some of these problems are reciprocal with the capacities of the original. On one hand, for instance, this paratactical text provides unmatched freedom. Since the text does not labor under schematic requirements, it can and must take a decisively new breath for every line. Those insights that authors of traditional forms know to be some of the best of what they have thought but must constantly reject as structurally inapposite are what at every point motivate a paratactical text. But on the other hand, this paratactical style is, by that same measure, unable, as mentioned, to refer backward or forward. Adorno never writes, as mentioned. Every transition must be a transition in the object itself if it is not to unhinge the text. Thus, the text is deprived of a major technique for building on what has been, or of explicitly organizing itself toward what will be, developed elsewhere and it cannot take the sitting out of repetition by acknowledging it, take the sting out of repetition by acknowledging it. Instead, Adorno is constantly compelled to start anew saying what has already been said. The text produces a need for repetition that is its innermost antagonist. 
Thus, Adorno throughout repeatedly restates major motifs, that the artwork, artwork is a modad, that it is a social microcosm, that society is most intensely active in an artwork where it is most remote from society. If Adorno is a master of thematic variation, able to use the dynamic energy of these repeated motifs, not just to justify what is waiting to be said, but as a catapult for new insights, all the same, anyone who actually studies the book will rankle at a repetitiveness that really is as inevitable as it comes to seem. The text is single-mindedly concerned with escaping jargon and developing what is potentially new in concepts that have become rigidified, rigidified and obsolete. But the obligatory repetitiveness of its formulations counts jargon and courts jargon and makes the central motifs of the work vulnerable to facile trivialization by anyone who cares to do so. The paratactical capacity that prompts the text's protean insights engenders repetition that becomes disorienting. All those markers that measured out space and time longitudinally in traditional forms are discarded, and there is a constantly looming sense of being caught in a vortex, as if there is no knowing whether one has been through a particular passage before, or if perhaps one has never left the spot. The virtual presence of the whole of the text at any one point is impeded by the form in which it is maintained. This level of repetitiveness is damaging to the original and it makes its toll on the translation. More regrettable, however, because it does not derive from any capacity of the text, is the repetition that originates in the fact that it is an opus posthumous. Adorno completed aesthetic theory, but he did not finish it. Every section that he intended to write for the book was written. The main body of the text was for the most part complete and composed at the highest level that Adorno achieved in any of his work. That Adorno did not live to carry out the final crucial revision of the text. In this revision, he would have rewritten a significant number of passages, inserted a group of passages that had accumulated in various ways external to the main text in the decade during which the book was written, and he would have written a new introduction to the book that would have replaced a draft with, with which he was dissatisfied. After Adorno's death, this editing work could only partially be fulfilled by his longtime student and friend. Rolf Tiedemann, and by Adorno's widow, Gretel Adorno. They deciphered Adorno's handwriting in the main text, collected the fragments into the Paralipomena that in this edition comes after the main text, and appended the draft introduction and an excursus entitled Theories on the Origin of Art. At the end of this volume, they have provided an afterword in which they describe in detail the state of the text at Adorno's death and how they constructed the present volume. As they point out, they could not rewrite passages even when they, the needed improvements were self-evident. And the intense philological pressures in a country whose Protestantism invented the discipline and where they are, for instance, left-wing and right-wing editions of Holderlin prohibited the exclusion of even obviously contradictory formulations. What weighs most on this text weighs on it literally. There is much more here than is needed by about one-fifth. In his final revision, Adorno would have been able to discard a great deal. The repetitive discussions of classicism and genius, for instance, which now seem strewn around, could have been grouped and condensed and had Adorno had the chance to definitively, definitively position three extensive sections that were still external to the text at the time of his death, he would have been able to exclude duplicate passages that permit their integration at several different points. The editors combined and inserted these extensive sections in plausible ways, but there is no doubt that this has resulted in several overlong main parts that disturb the organization of the book. For instance, as Tiedemann and Gretel Adorno point out, various aspects of situation are needed in the book's development from art, society, aesthetics to on the categories of the ugly, the beautiful, and technique. But the sheer girth of situation combines so much material that it diffusely 
interferes with the tightly wrought organization of the first five main parts. It is furthermore questionable whether the excursus theories on the origin of art could have been included in the final version. Although it is obviously germane to the problems Adorno treats throughout aesthetic theory, it is a research essay and in majority stylistically at odds with the rest of the text. And it doesn't make sense to have an excursus in a text that is all paratactical divagation, divagation anyway. As a guess, however, it is easy to imagine how parts of the excursus could have been used in the new introduction that Adorno wanted to write. Nothing is to be done about these layers of repetitiveness in the text. They burden the book at every point. But it's worth knowing that however overlong the book is, there's nothing to skim. There is, for instance, much in the Paralopenmena that is not to be found anywhere else in the text. And if Adorno found the draft introduction inadequate, it may take some years of research to figure out why. It is in any case probably the best place to begin reading aesthetic theory. The paratactical organization of the book does not mean that it can be read equally well in any direction. It is not argumentative, it does not seek to convince, but it does present a logic of insight that has a distinct forward direction that develops concentrically and, as indicated, this is best perceived by initially reading situations separate from the first five main parts. The less finished main parts, such as situation, were often more difficult to translate than the more finished parts, though this was only a slight difference of degree. No reader will imagine the linguistic mayhem out of which this translation is built, and the ditches, craters, and rubble over which each English sentence passes are more than crushed syntax. The historical breach on the other side of which German now stands makes even this translator involuntarily prefer to say the original rather than the German. It made it necessary to say, page by page, that it is, or was, a Jewish language too. This translation is allied with Adorno's return to Germany and that his need to return there to be able to write such works such as aesthetic theory was inseparable from an impulse to pick up the severed threads of what was not fascist in Germany's past and the value of which, however alloyed, he never doubted. His enormous importance in the post-war decades was that he succeeded in helping to reestablish Germany's own relation to that past, not in the search of the primal or an alliance with any anti-humanism, but as an aesthetic theory, in defense of a modernism that would not betray the hopes of the past. This is not to say that Adorno returned to Germany to fit in and help restore the nation to what it once was. What he wrote was completely unpalatable to the former Nazi faculty, still in its prime, that controlled Frankfurt University after the war. They rejected writings such as Minima Moralia as unscholarly and the whole of Adorno's work as essayistic and fragmentary and saw to it that he was not offered a professorship. Only under coercion did they grudgingly bestow on him what became known as Wiedergutmachungsstall, a faculty position made not because he merited it as a philosopher, but in reparation to a Jew who had been deprived by the war of his property, his teaching post. Early two decades after his return, Leftist students who had idolized him and embraced his works rioted in his seminars because he refused to lead them to the barricades. Adorno's freedom to teach was forcibly rescinded, as it had been in the 30s. In the summer recess following the student demonstrations of 1969, he died of a heart attack while trying to finish this book. After Adorno's death, interest in his writings soon dissipated, but today when he Today, when he has studied in Germany, he is regarded mainly as a historical curiosity and more likely to be diminished than admired. For over a decade, the most thorough, widely read, and esteemed history of his work, Wolf Wiegerhaus's The Frankfurt School, dismisses him as a bitter, hyper-emotional complainer, monotonously prejudiced in his views, irresponsibly protean in his thought, and unable to formulate testable hypotheses. Wiegerhaus's book, in that it embodies a generation's rejection of Adorno, echoed in dozens of similar work, 
points up the fact that aesthetic theory is currently as obliquely remote to Germany as it is to the United States. And this remoteness is requisite to any plausible value it may have. For as Adorno wrote in constantly varied formulations, only what does not fit in can be true. You would not have been interested in seeing this book received here. Like all those works whose strands Adorno returned to Germany to pick up, when aesthetic theory is seen for what it is, it stands outside and looks in. Although the book does in many ways appear obsolete to us, today no one would try a dialectical reversal. Now nothing seems precisely the opposite of anything else. And that shift of quantity into quality, such as when water cooling becomes ice, is no longer an inspiring mystery. This perspective that condescends from the vantage of being up to date as to the odd cut of an old coat or dress reveals its delusiveness when instead it is wondered how we look to it. For even though students once complained that Adorno had no interest in praxis but was preoccupied only with art, from the book's perspective, it will be noticed that the word has completely disappeared from contemporary language, whereas for this book on art, Praxis would be the ensemble of means for minimizing material necessity, and as such, it would be identical with pleasure, happiness, and that autonomy in which these means are sublimated." End quote. Much of what catches the eye as obsolete in aesthetic theory is what would be new if it were not blocked. Here is what is perceived as old hat masks the disappointment of what can no longer be hoped for. <clears throat> Aesthetic theory wants to be what is German that is not German. And if it finds real resonance here, it, it will be with what is American that is not American, none of which could be put on a list of national character traits. What is hard about translation is not, as those who have never tried it imagine, finding the right word. The right word is always there, it just can't be used. Inevitably, it starts with the same letter as the three words on either side of it, and, in a translation, pulling four oranges says fake, not jackpot. Line by line, the wrong word is always unbearably coming to the rescue. The sureness with which translation taps fate puts the I Ching to shame. The word needed at any point has somehow always just been used in the previous clause to cover for some other right word that would not fit. If translation were just pinning the tail on the donkey, it would be easy. But the donkey is running and the translator, translator is riding another beast, going in some other direction. Each language and each and every word has its own momentary vector. So for instance, even when the original wants to dictate the right word, e.g. program, directly into English, with only a slight shift of spelling, it turns out that the English equivalent now instinctually summons up computers, not the self-understood political sense of the original, with barely containable textual implications. Since the right word was always waiting, and had to be left waiting, this translation is made up of whatever else was handy, a carrot for the nose, light bulbs for eyes, some feathers for the mustache, Propped on a bench in the distance with its back to the sunset, perhaps it even looks alive. But it is not to be leaned against, and neither will it bear all that much scrutiny. In German, this book is almost too interesting to read. For those many passages in English where this is no longer the case, where it was just not possible to find any better way to do it, for the many sentences that were each finally accepted as not really, but sort of what it means, I can only say it was not for lack of trying. Well, that's the introduction. It's kind of uh, throwing me through a loop on like where I should start. I'm just going to have a look. Situation, it's suggested starting with situation, which is a section that's quite long. It also is just starting with the draft introduction. I'm just going to start in the way that it's presented. Aesthetic theory. Beginning now after 40 minutes of reading. If that introduction was any uh, foreshadow of what is to come, it's uh, not looking good for my uh, 
uh, you know, presumptive literacy. Okay. It is self-evident that nothing concerning art is self-evident anymore. Not its inner life, not its relation to the world, not even its right to exist. The forfeiture of what could be done spontaneously or unproblematically has not been compensated for by the open infinitude of new possibilities that reflection confronts. In many regards, expansion appears as contra contraction. The sea of the formerly inconceivable, on which around 1910 revolutionary art movements set out, did not bestow the promised happiness of adventure. Instead, the process that was unleashed consumed the categories in the name of that for which it was undertaken. More was constantly pulled into the vortex of the newly taboo. Everywhere artists rejoiced less over the, constant, over the newly won realm of freedom than that they immediately sought once again the after ostensible yet scarcely adequate order. For absolute freedom in art, always limited to a particular, comes into contra contradiction with the perennial unfreedom of the whole. In it, the place of art becomes uncertain. The autonomy is achieved after having freed itself from cultic function and its images, was nourished by the idea of humanity. A society becomes became ever less a human one. This autonomy was shattered. Drawn from the ideal of humanity, art's constituent elements withered by art's own law of movement. Yet art's autonomy remains irrevocable. All efforts to restore art by giving it a social function, of which art is itself uncertain and by which it expresses its own uncertainty, are doomed. Indeed, art's autonomy shows signs of blindness. Blindness was never an aspect of art. In the age of art's emancipation, however, this blindness has begun to predominate in spite of, if not because of, art's lost naivete which, as Hegel already perceives, art cannot undo. This binds art to a naivete of a second order, the uncertainty over what purpose it serves. It is uncertain whether art is still possible, whether with its complete emancipation it did not sever its own preconditions. This question is kindled by art's own past. Artworks detach themselves from the empirical world and bring forth another world, one opposed to the empirical world, as if this other world, too, were an autonomous entity. Thus, however tragic they appear, artworks tend a priori towards affirmation. The cliches of art's reconciling glow and folding the world are repugnant, not only because they parody the emphatic cons concept of art with its bourgeois version and class it among those Sunday institutions that provide solace. Sunday institutions. These cliches rub against the wound that art itself bears. As a result of its inevitable withdrawal from, from theology, from the unqualified claim to the truth of salvation, a secularization without which art would never have developed, art is condemned to provide the world as it exists with a consolation that, shorn of any hope of a world beyond, strengthens the spell of that from which the autonomy of art wants to free itself. The principle of autonomy is itself suspect of giving consolation. By undertaking to posit totality out of itself, whole and self-encompassing, this image is transferred to the world in which art exists and that engenders it. By virtue of its rejection of the empirical world, a rejection that inheres in art's concept and thus is no mere escape, but a law imminent to it, art sanctions the primacy of reality. In a work dedicated to the praise of art, Helmut Kuhn warranted that art's each and every work is a paean. His thesis would be true were it meant critically. In the face of the abnormity into which reality is developing, art's inescapable affirmative essence has become insufferable. Art must begin against itself, in opposition to its own concepts, and thus become uncertain of itself right into its innermost fiber. Yet art is not to be dismissed simply by its abstract negation. 
by attacking what seemed to be its foundation throughout the whole of its tradition, art has been qualitatively transformed. It itself becomes qualitatively other. It can do this because through the ages, by means of its form, art has turned against the status quo and what merely exists just as much as it has come to its aid by giving form to its elements. Art can no more be reduced to the general formula of consolation than to its opposite. The concept of art is located in a historically changing constellation of elements. It refuses definition. Its essence cannot be deduced from its origin as if the first work were a foundation on which everything that followed were constructed and would collapse if shaken. The belief that the first artworks are the highest and purest is warmed over Romanticism. With no less justification, it could be claimed that the earliest artistic works are dull and impure, that they are not even are not yet separated from magic, historical documentation, and such pragmatic aims as communicating over great distances by means of calls or horn sounds. The classical conception of art gladly made use of such arguments. In bluntly historical terms, the facts blur. The effort to subsume the historical genesis of art ontologically under an ultimate motif would necessarily founder in such disparate material that the theory would emerge empty-handed except for the obviously relevant insight that the arts will not fit into any gapless concept of art. In those studies devoted to the aesthetic uh, Greek word, positivistic sampling of material and such speculation as is otherwise disdained by the sciences flourish wildly alongside each other. Bakofen is the best example of this. If nevertheless one wanted in the usual philosophical fashion categorically to distinguish the so-called question of origin as that of art's essence from the question of art's historical origin, that would amount only to turning the concept of origin arbitrarily against the usual sense of the word. The definition of art is at every point indicated by what art once was, but it is legitimated only by what art became with regard to what it wants to, and perhaps can become. Although art's difference from the merely empirical is to be maintained, this difference is transformed in itself qualitatively. Much that was not art, cultic works, for instance, has over the course of history metamorphosed into art. And much that was once art is that no longer. Posed from on high, the question whether something such as film is or is no longer art leads nowhere. Because art is what it has become. Its concept refers to what it does not contain. The tension between what motivates art and art's past circumscribes the so-called question of aesthetic constitution. Art can be understood only by its laws of movement, not according to any set of invariants. It is defined by its relation to what it is not. The specifically artistic in art must be derived concretely from its other. That alone would fulfill the demands of a materialistic dialectical aesthetics. Art acquires its specificity by separating itself from what it develops out of. Its law of movement is its law of form. It exists only in relation to its other. It is the process that transpires with its other. Nietzsche's late insight, honed in opposition to traditional philosophy, that even what has become can be true, is axiomatic for a reoriented aesthetic. The traditional view, which he demolished, is to be turned on its head. Truth exists exclusively as that which has become. What appears in the artwork as its own lawfulness is the late product of an inner technical evolution, as well as art's position within progressive secularization. Yet doubtless artworks became artworks only by negating their origin. They are not to be called to account for the disgrace of their ancient dependency on magic, with servitude to kings and amusement as if this were art's original sin, for art retroactively annihilated that from which it emerged. Dinner music is not inescapable for, liberal, for liberated music, nor was dinner music 
honest service from which autonomous art outrageously withdrew. The former's miserable mechanical clattering is on no account improved because the overwhelming part of what now passes for art drowns out the echo of that clatter. Dinner music. What is dinner music? The Hegelian vision of the possible death of art accords with the fact that art is a product of history. That Hegel considered art transitory while all the same chalking it up to absolute spirit stands in harmony with the double character of his system, yet it prompts a thought that would never have occurred to him, that the substance of art, according to him, its absoluteness, is not identical with art's life and death. Rather, art's substance could be its transitoriness. It is thinkable, and not merely an abstract possibility, that great music, a late development, was possible only during a limited phase of humanity. The revolt of art teleologically posited in its attitude to objectivity toward the historical world has become a revolt against art. It is futile to prophesy whether art will survive it. What reactionary cultural pessimism once vociferated against cannot be suppressed by the critique of culture. That, as Hegel ruminated 150 years ago, art may have entered the age of its demise. Just as Rimbaud's stunning dictum 100 years ago divined definitively the history of new art, his later silence, his stepping into line as an employee, anticipated art's decline. It is outside the purview of aesthetics today whether it is to become art's necrology, that it must not play at delivering graveside sermons, certifying the end, savoring the past, and abdicating the favor in favor of one sort of barbarism that is no better than the culture that has earned barbarism as recompense for its own monstrosity. Whether art is abolished, perishes, or despairingly hangs on, it is not mandated that the content, gehalt, of art, of past art perish. It could survive art in a society that had freed itself of the barbarism of its culture. Not just aesthetic forms, but innumerable themes have already been, become extinct, adultery being one of them. The adultery filled Victorian and early 20th century novels it's scarcely possible to empathize directly with this literature now, given the dissolution of the high bourgeois nuclear family and the loosening of monogamy. Distorted impo and impoverished, this literature lives on only in illustrated magazines. At the same time, however, what is authentic in Madame Bovary and was once embodied in its thematic content has long since outstripped this content and its deterioration. Obviously, this is not grounds for its historico-philosophical optimism over the invincibility of spirit. It is equally possible for the thematic material in its own demise to take with it that which is more than merely thematic. Art and artworks are perishable, not simply because by their heteronomy, heteronomy they are dependent, but because right into the smallest detail of their autonomy which sanctions the socially determined splitting off of spirit by the division of labor. They are not only art, but something foreign and opposed to it. Add mixed with art's own concept is the ferment of its own abolition. There is no aesthetic refraction without something being refracted, no imagination without something imagined. This holds true particularly in the case of art's imminent purposiveness. In its relation to empirical reality, art sublimates the latter's governing principle of cesse conservare, cons cesse conservare as the ideal of the self-identity of its works. As Schoenberg said, one paints a painting, not what it represents. Inherently, every artwork desires identity with itself. An identity that in empirical reality is violently forced on all objects as identity with the subject and thus travestied. Aesthetic identity seeks to aid the non-identical, which in reality is re 
repressed by reality's compulsion to identity. Only by virtue of separation from empirical reality, which sanctions art to model the relation of the whole and of part according to the work's own need, does the artwork achieve a heightened order of existence. Artworks are after images of empirical lives insofar as they help the latter to what is denied them outside their own sphere and thereby free it from that to which they are condemned by reified external experience. Although the demarcation line between art and the empirical must not be effaced, the least of all by the glorification of the artist, artworks nevertheless have a life sui generis this life is not just their external fate. Important artworks constantly divulge new layers. They age, grow old, and die. It's a tautology to point out that as humanly manufactured art artifacts, they do not live as do people. But the emphasis on the artifactual element in art concerns less the fact that it is manufactured than its own inner constitution, regardless of how it came to be. Artworks are alive in that they speak in a fashion that is denied to natural objects and the subjects who make them. They speak by virtue of the communication of everything particular in them. That's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>